The message is about denying our flesh in order to follow Christ. When I say denying our flesh, I don't mean saying no to good times with family. I don't mean saying no to delicious food. I don't mean uh, saying no to a good night's sleep after a hard day's work. Denying the flesh, we're talking about our selfishness, our self-centeredness, the I'm, the I'm right mentality. Learning to say no to that, learning to say no to our own, uh, instead of our comfort zone being our God, God is, is our God. Uh, when I teach about this, I really have some serious trepidation. I have some major concerns. One is that uh, if I gave you the impression this morning that uh, pastor's up there and he's pre preaching about this because he's really, really got this rock solid. Uh, he's, he doesn't ever struggle with uh, the cravings, desire of his flesh. Uh, that would make me a hypocrite. And I, I don't want to portray that this morning. I can promise you with all my heart that I know God's way is best, and I want to follow God's way. Uh, but I'm up here in front of you saying that the message, much greater than the messenger. I don't have my act all together on this. And uh, I want to, and I hope everybody in our church says, you know what? What Jesus is calling us to, it sounds horribly difficult, but it's right, and it's good, and I want to be on the side of rightness and, and righteousness and goodness and, and love. So I want to make it clear that I'm preaching this because this is what Christ taught and it's what came next in the chapter. But I'm not teaching this. Uh, I don't want you to think that I've nailed all this stuff or gotten my act completely together on this. Uh, far from it. And, you know, honestly, when it comes to enduring suffering... Uh, denying yourself, I don't even want practice. I, I want before God to be able to do it well when the time comes. But I'm just like everybody else. I pray, Lord, I don't want to suffer. I don't want to suffer financially. I don't want to suffer relationally. I don't want to suffer uh, physically. Uh, you know, I don't want any of that. And when I look at you, I want joy and happiness. And you know what? Maybe because I'm a wimp, but I, and I don't like hard times, and I love you guys, I really, really hope your lives are easy and, and fun. Why not? But fun, nothing's wrong with fun. Let's not pray that God sends trials into each other's lives so that we can demonstrate our godly character. Second concern I have is... Uh, I honestly wonder sometimes, does, does anybody, you don't have to raise your hands because you'll just embarrass yourself uh, if you know anything. Does anybody sometimes think that Pastor Dan is just always digging up these really hard stuff and he's always looking at stuff about crucifying our flesh and he's always talking about greater commitment and, and he's talking about denying yourself, he's talking about putting your pride down and why is Pastor Dan always talking about these, these hard things? He's just finding it, skipping around all the parts that say us, oh, you're so wonderful, and God wants you to be rich. And that's, guys, if you ever think that, that's why we took five, more than five years in the Old Testament. That's why we, we've been going through Matthew just bit by bit by bit. I'm not skipping around, guys. We're going through, and if the messages sound difficult week after week after week, this is the Bible God gave me to work with. Sometimes I really get excited when we hit one of those, and I thought, oh, everybody's going to love this one. This is easy and fun. Those don't come so often, and, and it's like Jesus didn't give us those so often for a reason. I wonder. So we're not skipping around. We're just hitting what comes next, and I'm not, like, slanting this or making it up or trying to twist it. It's just trying to teach what God gives. I, I want to be faithful to this, right? Why would you even be here if the pastor is not going to be faithful to what comes in the scriptures so it's hard and, and so I hope you don't think that I'm just digging up all the difficult stuff and skipping the fun stuff because apparently apparently faith in God is difficult apparently God calls us to a high standard that's difficult apparently this deny your stuff take up your cross and follow me is not simple and easy 
I don't know. That's, apparently that's the way it is. My third worry is that as we read Christ's words of challenge and radical discipleship, uh, there's two things we could do. You could just wallow in unworthiness. Oh, I don't measure up. I'm not a real Christian. I don't. Or you could say, man, why? Woo. I got my act together. I'm pretty awesome. Uh, the remedy for both of these extremes is to put your eyes on the cross. The cross. We're not worthy because of what we've done or what we're going to do. We're worthy because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Don't wallow and don't congratulate yourself. The cross will fix either one of those particular problems. Jesus calls us to radical faith. He doesn't want us to just live like the neighbors, live like the folks on television. Radical, different, extreme. In denial of self, say no to myself and yes to God again and again and again. Saying yes to the one who went on the cross to pay for my sins, to have faith that his ways are better than my ways, his ways are higher than my ways. That's what it's all about. It's all about him. It's not about us. So those are some of my concerns this morning. And uh, if you could just pray that I will be faithful to the word of God and that everyone in our congregation will be uh, ready and willing eager to receive the things of God, I'd appreciate that. So let's just bow our heads and close our eyes right now and give this time to God. Let's pray. Thank you. Matthew chapter 16, 1 through 20. We're going to blitz through the first part of this uh, book in chapter Matthew chapter 16. And if you're uh, wondering why, it's because I want to spend some more time with the last part of it. The Pharisees and the Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. He replied, when evening comes, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. In the morning, today it will be a stormy day, for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you can't interpret the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign or is always craving for a miracle, but none will be given it except for the sign of Jonah. Uh, Jonah was in the cavity, maybe the mouth of the whale there, the mouth of the fish for, for three days, and so Jesus is going to be in the ground for three days. Uh, all I want us to get out of that is if Jesus says a wicked and adulterous generation is always craving a miracle, uh, we don't want to be something that God looks at us as as a, a wicked and adulterous church. We don't want that. And so let's uh, make sure that our heart is like God's heart. Uh, Jesus then left them and went away, and we also don't want that, right? We don't want that. So let's be a church that's pleasing to the Lord. When they went across the lake, the disciples forgot to take bread. Be careful, Jesus said to them. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They discussed this among themselves and said, It's because we didn't bring any bread. So this is, these, who is Matthew? He's one of the disciples. He was right there with them, and he's writing this. <coughs> or he, he spoke it and it was written down. And I appreciate the fact that he made himself look like a fool. Uh, because he was just saying, this is the way we, we weren't getting it. He's just being honest. We weren't getting it uh, with God. Uh, aware of their discussion, Jesus asked, You of little faith, why are you talking among yourselves that you have no bread? Do you not understand? Don't you remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many baskets you gathered, or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many basketfuls you gathered? How is it that you don't understand that I was not talking about bread? 
It, I, you could just picture Jesus. What, was he going like this? How is it that you guys don't understand I wasn't talking about bread? But be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The yeast is what goes in the dough to make it expand. So a little bit of teaching from the Pharisees. The Pharisees, you could think real quick, are like the theological conservatives of their age. They were really patriotic, pro-Israel. They were, they were very uh, legalistic. They had a lot of rules. They're very religious. And the Sadducees, you can think in simple terms, they were like the theological liberals of their day. They didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't uh, believe in life after death. And they were part of the real ingrained in the power structure. They were trying to run the country and whatnot. And Jesus said, a little bit from either one of those two groups. Watch out for it. Watch out for it. Then, Matthew says, they understood that he was not talking to them about yeast in bread. He was talking about the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So again, I just appreciate Matthew being so honest about how silly they looked. Uh, verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? So the Son of Man is a phrase that comes out of the Old Testament book of Daniel. This divine figure, God applies it, Jesus applies it to himself all the time. Caesarea Philippi is in the north part. It's north of the Sea of Galilee. And so it's not over by Phoenicia where, where the woman with the child, remember, who came and said, my daughter is demon-possessed, please help her. It's not over there. It's a little more north instead of west, so it's not near the coast. And, but it's a heavily Gentile area. Uh, so Jesus, again, is taking his disciples to a place where a lot of, of Gentiles live in, in uh I think mom and dad were, were the ones that clued me on to something interesting that's going on here uh, a few months ago. So uh, Jesus took them to the region of Caesarea Philippi. He asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? So he's saying, who do people say I am? Because everybody's talking about Jesus right now. They replied, some say John the Baptist. John the Baptist got his head cut off, right? But Jesus is doing such miraculous things. They're saying, Wow. John the Baptist was this prophet who got his head cut off. Is, is he back again? Is this John the Baptist going around doing all these miracles? So some people say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. Remember Elijah in the fiery chariot, and he didn't have to die. He just went right up into heaven in the Old Testament. Still others say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets, maybe because he was quoting from Jeremiah. Uh, and Jesus said, but what about you guys? Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I will tell you that you are Peter, and his name kind of sounds like rock, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of death, the gates of hell, will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Some translators think a better way to say it, whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. It's a very, very difficult passage to translate. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. So there's some really, really interesting things going on here. Uh, Jesus says to him, who do people say they am? And people are talking about Jesus. He's obviously some sort of prophet in and some people say John the Baptist or one of the Old Testament prophets. He said, but who do you guys say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Messiah. You're the Savior, the Anointed One. You are the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon, uh, Peter, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you in a physical sense. This was revealed to you by my Father in heaven, by God in heaven. And he says, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Now, there's several different interpretations of what's going on here. I'm not going to stop to slow down for this, other than to say that uh, maybe you've heard the Catholic Church thinks that Jesus is saying that, Peter, you are the one. I'm going to build my church on you. So all the popes after Peter are kind of like descendants of Peter, and so I'm building my church on you. The Protestant view is Peter says, Peter says, you are the, uh, the Messiah, the Son of God, and and Jesus says, just like your name is Rock, I'm going to build my church, my church. So he's, we already have the church, right? At that time, there's no church. Isn't that a cool prophecy? 
Jesus is speaking about after his death. He's speaking in the future. I'm going to build my church just on what you said. And wherever my word goes, people are going to teach Jesus is the Messiah. He's the son of the living God. That's the rock that the church is built upon. Uh, There's something else that's going on in here. I will build my church and the gates of death, hell, Hades, will not overcome it. Uh, right near Caesarea Philippi, and Jesus had traveled way out of his way to go up there, there was a famous temple on this giant rock, this kind of like rocky mountain hill, hillside, and in the side of it were a lot of little alcoves where a lot of idols were. So that rock that was in that region was famous for idol worship. And then there was a big gate that they called the Gate of Pan. Remember, Pan was the goat god, you know, one half goat, the other half man kind of guy. And in that gate was supposed to be, it was a cave that was supposed to lead to hell. Jesus took his disciples north and said, I'm building my church on the rock, this message, who I am. I'm the son of God who's come down into the world. And not even this huge Gentile worship place, not even the gates of hell, Pan, right over there where they practiced uh, where they practiced temple prostitution, where they practiced bestiality. It was famous for being degenerate and wicked. Jesus says, that's not going to stand up. I'm going to build my church. This message is going to go out, and paganism like that will crumble before it. And, of course, that prophecy uh, came true. And then Jesus says, I'm going to give you the the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And he's talking here about his church. It's going to grow. The church is based on this message. Whoever proclaims, wherever this message is proclaimed that Jesus is the Messiah, that he's the Son of God, that's where the church is. And there's something interesting that's going on here. In ancient Jewish writing, and again, there's at least three or four different interpretations of what's going on here, and none of them actually completely satisfy me. So I'm going to give you the one that uh, makes the most sense to me. That In the context of establishing the church, he's telling them a little about this church It's no longer going to be through the synagogues. Now the church is established on this teaching about who Jesus is. In ancient Jewish writing, the term for binding and loosing meant uh, it was given to like the Pharisees in the synagogues, and that meant they have an authority to interpret the law for that group of believers, for that that, uh, culture. So the Pharisees did it to their communities, and now Jesus is saying the church that proclaims that I am the Messiah, uh, that I'm the son of the living God. This is the rock that the church will be built on. And the church now, instead of the synagogues, the church has the power, the authority to interpret the law for the congregation. So I think that's a, a very real possibility for, for that one. Okay, let's go down to verse uh, 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. He's going to suffer things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Okay, the reason why you're all sitting there regular, normal, is because you already know the story. The disciples didn't already know the story. And they didn't sit there normal and regular. Jesus Christ is growing his ministry. Thousands of people are coming to him. Demons are being cast out. People are being healed. Miraculous wonders everywhere. And Jesus starts to say to him, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, and I'm going to be beaten and tortured, and then I'm going to be killed. And on the third day, I'm going to rise again. And they didn't like that. Because their idea of a Messiah was going to be somebody like the Messiahs in the Old Testament, saviors in the Old Testament, was when somebody came and they saved the country through warfare. They would save the people of Israel and and kick out the invaders. And so they were probably waiting for Jesus, you know, just the way Samson fought the Philistines. They thought Jesus is going to fight the Romans, probably. He's going to save the kingdom. He's going to set up a new kingdom. So Peter took Jesus aside. Well, in the old culture... In the ancient culture, when you had a rabbi, you were supposed to walk behind him. Walk behind him closely so that the dust of his sandals, even his dust would cover you because you were supposed to emulate and watch your rabbi for everything, your teacher. You were never supposed to stand in front of your rabbi. 
and you weren't even supposed to teach in his presence because it was supposed to be, it was disrespectful to his teaching. So in front of the other disciples, Jesus says, wait, 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 wait. I mean, uh, Peter says, wait, 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 wait. He takes Jesus aside to correct Jesus. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Jesus, what are you talking about? We've got victory in our hands. You're going to take this country. We're going to change the world. He began to rebuke Jesus. Never, Lord. He calls him Lord. (laughs) This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Well, one, you're not supposed to be in front of me because I'm the rabbi. Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block. And the word block here is reminiscent of the word rock. So the same rock that could be solid now is a rock that is a stumbling block. Uh, You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have the mind of the concerns of God, but you have merely human concerns. Brothers and sisters, have we ever been there? That we don't have a God's viewpoint on things? We just have a human viewpoint on things? Jesus said, get behind me. This uh, is reminiscent. Remember when Jesus started his ministry and he went out in the wilderness? He was fasting. You remember that? And the devil went to him and he tempted him. The devil said, all you have to do is do things my way and I'll give you the world. Satan, again, right here, is come back and he's tempting Jesus. He's tempting Jesus. You can have the world and you don't have to die on the cross. You can have it and you don't have to suffer. You can have what you're after and you don't have to go through this hardship. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Whoever wants to... So Peter just said, you can have the kingdom and you don't have to suffer. She said, get behind me. You don't have the mind of God. And then he turns to his disciples and says, listen, guys, do you want to be my disciples? Because whoever wants it can have it. Whoever wants to be the disciple must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Why is Pastor Dan talking about this kind of stuff again? Because it was next. (laughs) It's next. It's right here. And the Bible's full of it. And maybe, let me just toss this out. Maybe the reason why we're sick and tired of hearing this is because we're not doing it. And maybe the reason God put it in there again and again and again and again is because I need to have my hard-headed skull thumped a few times. Brothers and sisters, we're really, really bad at denying ourselves anything. We're really, really good at seeking out comfortable places for ourselves. Whoever wants, this is Jesus talking. Brothers and sisters, let this shake you up a bit. This morning, Jesus is saying to us, do you want to be my disciple? You must deny yourself. You've got to pick up that cross. Now, we think cross is jewelry. The cross was a horrible, nasty, one of the worst ways to die ever invented. And Jesus says, you've got to die to yourself. You've got to pick it up. You've got to carry the cross to your own execution. But Jesus just wants me to be happy. Okay, I just read Jesus' words. Now you show me Jesus' words in here. There's a... It's here, okay? It's here. This is what we got to work with today. As much as sometimes I don't like to teach these things again and again, I want to be faithful. And that's why we're doing it again. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself and take up my cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life If you're trying to hold on to it, and life here kind of means like soul. He's not talking about physical life. He's talking about who you are. It's yourself. You're trying to hold on to this. I've got to get life. You're going to lose it. But whoever loses their life and gives it away, for my sake, Jesus says, for me, you're going to find real life. What good will it be for you to gain the whole world and forfeit your soul? 
what if everything goes your way? What if you win the lottery? What if your health is better than it's been since you were 20 years old? What, what if all the relationships go your way? What if, what if, what if, and you lose your soul? Where are you at? What if you win the prize for being the best factory worker of the week and you lose your soul? Best Teacher of the Year Award. That's something to be proud of. I'd be proud of you. And you lose your soul. You win an election. That's confirmation. That's affirmation. So many people love me. They really do. And you lose your soul. Dad of the Year. And you lose your soul. Finds out that Bill Gates is your long-lost great-great-uncle and he gave it all to you. And you lose your soul. Or what can you give in exchange for your soul? This whole planet, if you could have the planet, would you take it? Because, listen, well, I'm going to get to this more later. Whatever you decide to live for instead of Jesus, that's the price the devil just paid you for your soul. My life is going to be about my work. My life is going to be about this. My life. You just traded your soul. And that's the price the devil paid you. For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels. And then everyone will be rewarded according to what he's done. So he, he's saying, listen, you have to go to that cross. You got to deny yourself. Don't, don't trade anything in this world for your soul. But listen, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. I'm going to establish my kingdom here on earth, and I will reward everyone who follows me according to what you have done. Now, right away we get into this, we try to import this argument about salvation. Oh, is, is this works righteousness? We have to do works in order to get saved? We know that there's no amount of good deeds we could ever do to be saved. We know that. Oh, so, so how does this mean? He's, it obviously has to be about grace. Listen, it's more simple than that. Are you a real follower of Jesus Christ or not? A real follower is going to pick up his cross. A real follower is going to follow him. And Jesus says, when I come back, I'm going to know who my real followers are. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who are not going to taste death before they see the kingdom of the Son of Man, uh, before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And uh, that could be talking about standing in eternal life. That could be talking, some people think about uh, the coming at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit comes. Others think it's when the temple was destroyed in 70 AD and, and John and maybe some of the other apostles were still alive at that point. It could have just meant simply that when the church expands and the church goes from just these 12 guys to something victorious, that they're going to be there to see that, to see that day when Christ's message goes out to everyone. Uh, it could be about him coming back again and they're standing in eternity and seeing it. I'm not quite sure. Matthew Henry, the great uh, Bible scholar, said, self-denial, this is profound, okay? Self-denial is a hard lesson. Okay, very simplistic. Uh, <laughs> self-denial is a very hard lesson. Because I want to have a pity party. Because I have a right to be angry. Because my wife really doesn't understand me. Because I just need this more money so that how are we ever going to go on vacation and get that flat screen TV or whatever? I've got to start missing churches to get more money. Self-denial is a hard lesson. I've got plans, I've got dreams, I've got to... Self-denial is a hard lesson. Bible Gateway Commentary. And this is, I'm just going to quote a lot from the Bible Gateway Commentary today. Uh, I do this about once a year. I was trying to think, every once in a while I say, I'm just going to quote a lot from somebody else. The reason is because they said it so much better than I could say it. And this is maybe one of those pride goes before the fall kinds of things, but I was kind of feeling good. I didn't think I was being sinful, but I was still feeling good and thinking, wow, this God just unlocking this to me and the Spirit's revealing things to me in Matthew, and I'm not reading it in commentaries. And it's just 
And this week I'm reading it, and it's just kind of hitting a wall. And I started reading the commentaries, and I thought, wow, that's really good. And so this week, the commentaries all said it so much better than I could, and I, I thought they're so beautiful. So I'm just going to quote to you from commentaries. Okay, you could take some of my salary back for this week or, or whatever. Uh, I don't want to get in the way. I don't have to make it new for you guys all the time. Somebody else wrote this stuff, and it's really, really good. So I hope you listen as I read through this. Bible Gateway Commentary. It's not enough to confess that Jesus is Messiah. Okay, who believes that Jesus is God? Come on, who believes Jesus is God? Amen. You're in good company. Devil believes that too. The devil knows that Jesus is God. Doesn't mean he's saved. It's not enough to confess Jesus is Messiah if we do not understand that his messiahship involves suffering and death. And if Jesus' mission involves the cross, those who would follow him must embrace the same price. Where did they get that from? Well, probably this part about whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. That's a wild guess. That's probably where they got that from. The gospel message is incomplete without the cross. Let's be angry about people who portray Jesus Christ and they've got these huge ministries and they're on the television and whatnot and they, they never talk about the cross. They never talk about our sin. They never talk about what a great salvation we have in Jesus Christ. It's a false gospel. And they, they pick and choose and they're good at just digging through and finding one verse out of context to tell you how God wants you to be rich and that's their entire ministry. And simple people who want their ears tickled Go to hear them and give them all their money and they're getting what they deserve. The gospel is incomplete without the cross. Recognizing Jesus as the Messiah is a good first step. But not very helpful when his disciples' concept of Jesus' Messiahship differed so greatly from his own. They wanted an earthly kingdom. And how many people are peddling like some huckster, a Jesus that's going to... You know, I've seen a guy selling magic water or something or magic prayer shawls on tv you get this and they're embarrassing the name of jesus christ and it's a scam and it's more than people getting tricked people are going to go to hell because of this stuff people are going to burn because some people are going to buy it and think oh i'm right with jesus because i gave the televangelist a bunch of money and other people are going to say huh look at those idiots i don't want any part of this and they're going to be turned off to jesus christ because of these scam artists Jesus' messiahship meant that he would suffer and die. Those who wish to follow him must be ready to pay the same price. And if we hold up some nice Jesus and come to Jesus because we have pizza at our youth parties, which we sometimes do, but that's besides the point. Come to Jesus because then your marriage will be perfect and you'll have perfect children. And I'll tell, tell you what, you come to Jesus and do things his way, it's going to help your marriage. It's going to help you raise good kids. But they still have their own free will, you know. But this was never, Jesus, this message in the Bible is all, when God says he's pleading with us, he's pleading with us to confess our sins, get down on our knees and get saved. He's not pleading with us so that he can give us that Corvette that he really, really wants to. And you just don't ask for it. So I'm not going to give it to you. Jesus' messiahship meant that he would suffer and die. Those who wish to follow him must be ready to pay the same price. This is not an easy call. Let's not make this call easy. The cross was the most scandalous form of criminal execution in Jesus' day. Even the term sounded terrible to ancient readers. The cross. We're holding high the cross of Jesus Christ because... I'm wicked, nasty, depraved, selfish, self-righteous. And Jesus took all of that and he nailed it to the cross. And I stand before you today, I'm saved, I'm sanctified, I'm holy because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to heaven and I don't have any doubt about it because I know that God can keep his promises. And if you come to Jesus Christ, he will forgive you. And he will give you a new life. And heaven's doors will open wide. That cross, that cross is where he took our sin and God poured out his wrath on that cross. You know how much wrath God poured on that cross? All of it. 
So how much wrath is left for you if you put your faith in Jesus Christ? None of it. It's all used up. So let's not settle for something the devil is telling, some cheap imitation gospel that's really no gospel at all. When Peter tried to scold Jesus, Bible Gateway Commentary says, he was not only out of order, he was the devil's agent. At the wilderness temptation, Satan offered Jesus the kingdom without the cross. Peter now offers the same temptation, encounters the same uh, title. He's called the devil. The devil has influenced this world so deeply that the world's values are quite often the devil's values. Right? Right? The things that are valuable on television, the things that are valuable in our culture are often the things that the, the devil values. By valuing the things human beings value, like lack of suffering, I value lack of suffering. Again, don't pray for other people to have suffering in the church. Don't pray for yourself to have suffering. Uh, Peter shows himself in league with the devil. By valuing the things that the world values, like lack of suffering, Peter shows himself in league with the devil. Don't do this, okay? Raise your hand if you want to be in league with the devil. Don't do it. Well, I want the kingdom without suffering. I want all the blessings. Well, that Peter is a stumbling block shows that even a person who just declared faith in Jesus Christ can totally miss the point. Quote, that some of Jesus' religious contemporaries, some of Jesus' religious contemporaries were Satan's mouthpieces, shouldn't surprise us. Religious people? Our mouthpieces for Satan? Think, how many of us prefer comfortable beliefs to the cross today? How many of us want comfortable beliefs instead of the cross? Oh, you're good just the way you are. I don't even know what that cross is there for. You're so good. Jesus would let you into heaven. We don't need that cross. You know, there's a lot of stuff about sin and, and death and suffering. Let's just, let's, just, let's just pick and choose and get some verses out of context so I can tell you how God wants you to be rich. That'll be good. Let's do that. And if you're not rich, it's a lack of faith. Send me more money, you'll prove your faith. Uh, by the way, I'm joking. That's not what I believe, okay? Dad told me one time that when doing the devil's advocate stuff, it sounds like I really believe it. That's not what I do. I was just showing you how foolish that view was. Some of Jesus, <laughs> you got to make it clear, right? Look at it, I got a check in the mail. <laughs> yes. That some of Jesus' religious contemporaries were Satan's mouthpieces should not surprise us. Think of how many of us prefer comfortable beliefs to the cross today. Some Western Christians expect unlimited prosperity or teach that Christians will escape all tribulation while many of our brothers and sisters elsewhere, such as Iran or the Sudan, die for their faith. Is it not possible that some Christians still speak for the devil today? God forbid that we ever do that in this church. Lord, please, by your grace and mercy, never allow us to fall into that false gospel. Continuing on from the Bible Gateway Commentary. Anybody ever heard of Giuseppe Garibaldi? Uh, he's not the guy from that space drama a few years ago. What was that? Uh, what was that space drama? That was a good one. Garibaldi, that was good. Uh, but that, I think he got his name from this guy. Giuseppe Garibaldi was this kind of really mythic revolutionary figure. He, uh, he helped uni unite Italy. Before him, Italy was a lot of different separate countries. It wasn't one big country. And he went to South America and fought in revolutionary wars over there. When the American Civil War broke out, he sent a letter to, uh, to President uh, Lincoln and said, I want to, to be a general in the Northern Army. And we offered a generalship to this guy because he's so legendary. Everywhere he went, he was winning battles. And we were going to make him a general. But he said his condition is that the North declare to the world that this war is to stop slavery. And at that point, Lincoln really wasn't ready to make that public. So he, he denied it. But then when 
Lincoln gave the Emancipa Emancipation Proclamation. He got another letter from Giuseppe Garibaldi that said, from now on, you will be known to history as the Great Emancipator. And today, Lincoln is known as the Great Emancipator because of this Italian guy that most of us don't know about. Well, Giuseppe Garibaldi, uh, summoning, he was trying to get people to join the revolution to unite Italy. He cried out, he that loves Italy, let him follow me. I promise you hardship. I promise you suffering. I promise you death. But he that loves Italy, follow me. Only a cause that's worth dying for is worth living for. And that's, I always think that when I uh, imagine there's no heaven, you know, nothing to kill or die for. And I'm thinking, I don't want to die for my family. I don't want to die for Jesus Christ. What kind of a life do you have if nothing's worth, what's, what's worth living for, you know? Only a, he's from the Bible Gateway Commentary, only a cause worth dying for is truly worth living for. In a generation of Western youth deprived of great causes worth their lives, and of elder, elders who are personally committed enough to point the way to be examples has caused a restless and disillusioned generation. Our culture's messed up because we don't have anything worth living for or dying for. If disciples come after, imitate their teachers, Christians' lives are forfeit from the moment they begin following Jesus Christ. Don't, don't you think the Bible gateway commentary is kind of hitting this out of the park? If discipleship means coming after, means we imitate our teachers, we imitate Jesus, Christians' lives are forfeit the moment they begin to follow Jesus Christ because we deny ourselves. It's no longer about me, my ego. It's no longer about my image. It's no longer what I can get. I'm going to follow Jesus. Jesus Christ went to hell to save people. And if Jesus Christ is willing to go to hell, where and he says, come and follow me, where are we going to go? What are we going to go through? Those who wish to follow Christ should understand that from the start, they are surrendering their lives to Christ. Those who do not acknowledge Jesus as Lord as having the right to demand of them anything, including their lives, have yet to be truly converted. Today's Christians continue to debate the character of the gospel to be saved. Does one need to be accept Christ as Lord or only a Savior? Throughout the New Testament, however, the question is more or less a moot one. Jesus came to save us from our sin. Accepting him includes recognizing him as his rule over our lives. This does not imply that Christians are perfect. It does uh, indicate that they recognize who their king is. Losing one's life in this age would be a small price to preserve it in the eternal age to come. We must decide whether we want to come after Jesus or want to save our lives. We cannot have it both ways. The cross means death, nothing less. I want to be. I want to be able to have a pity party. I want to pout. I want to have my ego. Uh, I don't want to have to give these kind of messages again and again, but Jesus keeps putting them in the Bible. Brothers and sisters, this is hard. What, it, what was it? The great Bible commentary, Bible theologian, Matthew Henry, self-denial is a hard lesson. Now, why does Jesus tell us the path ahead of us is a path of suffering? Do you think God is getting kicks out of us suffering? Is it just about the suffering? I don't think so. Remember, he died for us. He obviously loves us. He, he wants us to be with him. He says, when you guys live your own way, it's like your horn pouring your lives away. It's like you're running away to prostitutes. I feel betrayed. And yet, I'll take you back. I'll take you back. There you go again. I'll take you back. He obviously is crazy passionate in his love for us. So it's not that he's eager to watch us suffer. In fact, he's got an eternity waiting for us where there will be no more suffering, no more pain, no more tears. So why does he call us to pick up our cross right now? He says, the cross that you have to pick up, you've got to carry it. 
I've got to carry my own torture, my own instrument of death. Yeah. Maybe the things that we go through now can do one of two things, or both. We talked about this the last few weeks. God's been really putting this on my heart. I've been thinking about how I got to, I got to see, I'm going to take a little more time here because I'm going to tell a story. Uh, Dad and I got to go to, Ma- to Madison a few years ago to see this movie Avatar. Did anybody see that with the giant blue aliens? Isn't that fun? And what you do in that movie is you kind of put your brain into the brain of this robot, but it was a, it was a creature. It was a flesh robot. And so, and so people could, there was, one of the main characters in that drama had, had his legs injured and he was paralyzed. But when he put his brain through this computer, you transfer it into this other creature, that, the big blue animal, the big blue creature, then he could run and he could jump again and everything. And, and Dad and I went to Madison and we saw the movie. Before it was the movie Avatar, there was a guy in a wheelchair parked in front of us. And Dad and I are talking about how we're excited to see the movie. And he turned around and there's already tears in his eyes. And he said, you guys are going to love this movie. And I think he'd seen the movie like nine times already. and just opened like two or three days ago. So he's seen it multiple times a day choked up and uh, and when I saw that movie and the guy who's paralyzed plugged his brain into this guy and he wakes up and his eyes wake up and he can feel when he gets out and he starts running he's just running and running and running and running and I knew the guy in the wheelchair is just soaking this in right in front of me it blew me away and I thought about heaven I thought a lot about heaven during that movie and I thought how uh when I get to heaven, I'm going to run across wide fields. I'm going to run to the Lord, and I'm not going to get weary. And I'm going to see on the horizon goodness and love everywhere I go, and that's going to be good for me. But somebody who's been paralyzed, who never had a sensation, or, or, you know, we'll open our eyes in heaven, we'll see things we never saw before. How about you've been blind? You open your eyes. Or how about you've been at church, you see people singing, and maybe you hear a thrum, a vibration, but you can't. And then you get to heaven and, whoa, praise God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. It's all around you. That's going to blow you and me away. But imagine you're hearing for the first time, and that's what you hear. The things we go through in this life magnify heaven for us. And if your cross to bear is that nobody understands you or you've been betrayed again and again and you've been left behind and you're hurting and nobody cares for you, your feeling of acceptance and love in heaven will be magnified even greater than others. If your cross to bear is bad health and poverty and you get to heaven and there's riches and great health, that will be magnified. Our suffering in this life, brothers and sisters, the suffering and pain in this life makes heaven even better. And Jesus Christ said, I'm going to wipe every tear from your eyes. There's going to be no more sickness. There's going to be no more pain. There's going to be no more death. Another thing is the fact that we go through pain and suffering enables us to be able to comfort other people when they're going through the same thing. And if our lives were always easier, we could ne- easy, we could never empathize. We could never feel with people whose lives are hurting the other thing is we need to be disciplined sometimes, and we need to learn that life is not all about these material things, that life is not always what you can get. And Christ, Christ disciplines us so we can learn to be holy and be more like Jesus. We're supposed to look up at Jesus and say, I want to be like him. And Jesus says, you want to be like me? Pick up that cross. Follow me. Deny yourself. And when I come back again, I will. Faith is, do you believe it? Or you say, I don't believe he's going to reward me, so i got to get everything I can get right now. The heck with him. That's a lack of faith. Jesus is worth any price. He's the pearl of great price. He's worth anything. And what, again, guys, what we sell ourselves for in this life, what, becomes, what takes our attention away from God, that's the price we're paying well, that's a price the devil's paying us for our soul. 
Losing one's life in this age would be a small price to preserve it in eternity or the age to come. We must decide what we want. The Adam Clark commentary puts it this way. The principles of the Christian life are, there's four of them. First, to have a sincere desire to belong to Christ. If any man be willing, he will be my disciple. In other words, do you want to follow Jesus? This morning, do you want to follow Jesus? Here's good news. He's not going to push you away. If you want to become a Christian, if you want to follow Jesus, humble yourself, come to Jesus, he will take you as you are. Secondly, to renounce self-dependence in selfish pursuits. But we're self-made. We're Americans. We do things. No, you're not going to get to heaven like that. You're not going to be much of a Christian like that. Deny yourself. I'm going to say it again. Deny yourself. Deny yourself. I have a right. No, you don't. You just got bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. He owns you. You don't have a right to put the screws on somebody and make them pay. I'm going to teach him a lesson. Wait, 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 wait. That's God's role. It's not my role. Thirdly, to embrace the condition which God has appointed, where we find ourselves in life. What do we say? To grow where you're planted, to blossom where you're planted. To embrace the condition which God has appointed and bear the troubles, carry the difficulties we may meet with, uh, in life when we walk the Christian road. We have to take up our cross daily. Take it up again. Tomorrow, maybe it's the same burden. Maybe five years later, it's the same burden. Maybe 10 years later, 20 years later, if we haven't gone upstairs, same burden. Pick up that cross. Say no to yourself. Fourthly, to imitate Jesus and do and suffer all in his spirit, we have to follow him. We have to follow him wherever he leads us. So I got this uh, off Facebook yesterday. Uh, it's a C.S. Lewis quote, and I've been told that some people really enjoy it when I quote from C.S. Lewis. Uh, C.S. Lewis said in the book, The Problem of Pain, I have seen great beauty of spirit in some who were great sufferers. Brothers and sisters, God wants us to be good sufferers. That when we have hardship, we don't pout and get angry. But the beauty of the Holy Spirit shines through us. Do you know, in this life, you don't need to be a Christian. Listen, you don't need to be a Christian to be joyful when life is going your way. You don't need the Holy Spirit. There's no, nothing, nothing supernatural about that. But to be patient in affliction is what the Bible says. It takes the Holy Spirit. And if we're going to show the love of God to people, even when life is beating us up, that's a supernatural. This is beyond the physical. This is supernatural. That's all about God. Brothers and sisters, you know in heaven, brothers and sisters, go out there and tell everybody you can about Jesus. You know why? Because in heaven you can't evangelize. There will be no more chance to evangelize. You think someday I'm going to start telling people about Jesus? Do it now. And guess what? We can give a gift to Jesus. Listen. We can give a gift to Jesus. Jesus, I love you. So to honor you, I'm going to obey you, and I'm going to suffer well in this life. I won't deny you. I won't embarrass you. I'm going to suffer well for you. In heaven, you can't give him that gift anymore. Only right here, right now, can we suffer well for our Lord. Brothers and sisters, <laughs> suffering without Jesus is just suffering. Suffering with Jesus is something beautiful, and it's holy. And we can't do it in heaven. So if I'm going to suffer well for the Lord, i got to try and do it now. C.S. Lewis, I have seen a great beauty of spirit in some who were great sufferers. I have seen men for the most part, grow better and not worse with advancing years. Lord, I don't want to get old. I don't want to. And yet, so many men become better men with their walking with the Lord as they get older. And I've seen the last illness, before somebody dies, I've seen the last illness produce treasures of fortitude and meekness from the most unpromising subjects. People you thought, oh, they're, they're never going to come around. And as they're laying there on that bed, you just see God overcome them, and you see God work in and through them. 
We think of suffering as bad because we don't like it. And again, I started this sermon by saying, I don't want it, I don't want to practice for it, and I pray that you guys don't have to have it. And yet, when it comes our way, I want to deal with it in a godly fashion. In a perfect world, there would be no suffering. In a perfect world, there will be no suffering. But this world is not perfect, and suffering is an unavoidable reality. When we suffer, let's not be surprised as if this has never happened to anybody else. Matthew Henry again said, Thousands lose their souls. Why? So they can become conquerors of the world. Thousands lose their souls so they can, what? Thousands lose their souls for the most trifling gain, for the smallest thing, or for the most worthless indulgence, nay, often for mere sloth and negligence. Some, a lot of people lose their souls because they're just lazy. I'm going to go to church someday. I, I, you know, that whole Christian thing is probably right, you know? Someday. Someday. Thousands, millions, billions lose their souls for this is the smallest, most ridiculous things. Whatever is the subject, the object, for which men forsake Christ, that is the price at which Satan buys their souls. Yet one soul is worth more than all the world. How do we know one soul is worth more than all the world? Because that's what Jesus says. This is Christ's judgment on the matter. He knew the price for souls because he went to the cross for our soul. And he's worth far more than this planet. And God wouldn't underrate the world because he made it. Your soul is worth more than this universe. Jesus, God in flesh, died for you. And what are you going to give in exchange for your soul? Whoever would follow Jesus must deny themselves. Pick up that cross. God's given you to carry it. We don't have to look at other people's crosses. And follow him wherever he goes. And unlike modern preachers, God is not giving us an easy invitation. God is not asking to be your sugar daddy. Let that sink in. He's not asking to be your Santa baby. He's telling you he's your teacher, he's your master, he's your king, he's your savior. Follow him. Follow him. And why did Jesus suffer? Because he loved us and he's trying to save us. And when we suffer in his name, it can be because of love and to bring salvation to the people around us. Because everybody suffers. You either do it with Jesus or you either do it alone or you do it with Jesus for Jesus for the kingdom of God. Is that making sense? Does that make sense? Hard message, right? I feel like saying, thanks, Jesus. You give me unpopular messages week after week. This is, we've been going through the Bible slowly. One of the reasons, because I don't want that accusation. This is just what comes. <laughs> and so, thank you, God. I, I guess it's, it's good and it's real. And uh, I believe it. And I don't always measure up. The message is greater than the messenger, but you know a church that learns to do these things? I think God smiles on a church like that. And I want to have a family. I'm looking at my daughters, and I'm hoping you get in this. Because you can just, I want to be happy, I want to be happy, I want to be happy, and then things Boom, crash in your life, and how are you going to deal with it, kids? My, all my kids? <laughs> this, this life, over like that. Let's, let's do the things now, like sharing our faith and giving this gift of suffering back to the Lord that we can't do in heaven. And let's win people to Jesus. But you know what? We're not going to be mouthpieces of Satan that promise the kingdom without the suffering. We're not going to hold up a Christianity without the cross. We're not going to forget about the blood which covers our sins. We're not going to forget that we're supposed to fall on our knees before the living God. We're going to share them the whole truth, the whole gospel. We're not going to leave anything out because it's unpopular. Amen? Amen. Let's do it. Let's pray. Lord God, here we are. Father, we come to you. And Lord, we want to follow you anywhere you go. You have the words of life. 
you died for us. You rose again. And you go through hardship just to win people to Jesus. Father, whatever you bring our way, I pray that we're faithful. Whatever you bring our way, I pray that as we go through it, as we give thanks in the midst of it, Lord, that we do so in a way that we're not mouthpieces of Satan, but we're instruments of your kingdom. Lord, we want more people in heaven, and we want you to use our church for that. And God, please use our families for that. Please use our lives for that, because nothing else compares. And what could we give in exchange for our souls, Lord? Nothing. And Lord, I pray that my own comfort zone is not more important than other people's eternal souls. God, I'm a slow study. God, you know I'm an idiot. I need you, Father, and I'm so glad that you want me. Thank you for dying for our sins. Help us to hold on tight. We're tempted to let go sometimes, Jesus, so we thank you that you hold on tight. and You never let go of your children. Help us to be like you, Jesus. We want to have that kind of love. Thank you, God, for this church. It's wonderful to be a part of it. Thank you for all the miracles you've done. You tell us that we shouldn't be wicked and evil and crave miracles, but we are thankful for them, Lord. We've seen them again and again. God, you're so good to us in ways that we don't deserve. I just want to end by saying thank you. God, thank you. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Jamesville Athletic Club.